So I suppose this being the uh, Christmas season, I should give a talk about Christmas. In Thailand, at the the monastery, what Nanachat, they used to have Chris Budimus. <laughs> and uh, they would have a big celebration. A big celebration, it's, what Nanachat, it's a very strict forest monastery, so a big celebration means to have an extra cup of tea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And that's something you look forward to for weeks. And uh, it's actually the cold season in Thailand at the moment. So it would be a kind of a cold morning and you get a cup of milky tea. And uh, so that would make it all kind of worthwhile. And they often say sometimes they show a movie as well. It's a bit controversial. They show a movie in the monastery. It's a bit naughty. Usually they show The Life of Brian was one of the, was the favorite. <laughs> so that's a kind of a religious message. <clears throat> but Christmas is one of those um, festivals which uh, um, Christianity has uh, kind of borrowed for a while. You know, in, in the old days they didn't have copyright. So they had this kind of, you know, kind of creative commons kind of licensing thing. Everyone could borrow everything from everybody else and uh, they never really complained about it. <clears throat> and so Christmas, of course, is a uh, not the literal birthday of Jesus. It's supposed to be the birthday of Jesus, but of course not the literal birthday. Uh, in fact, the early church, the early uh, Christian church used to celebrate Christmas on another day. I think it was like the 7th of January or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> um, but they found that that the pagan festivals on the twenty fifth of January were so popular that they decided to kind of co opt them by changing Jesus's birthday to fit onto the pagan uh, uh, ceremonies, which is you know skillful means, I guess. And uh, so this is how we find things happen in religions, and just like in archaeology, you find that uh, when the later religions come along, they they build their new temples on the sites of old temples. And this happens in ancient India. If you look back in the, the, the oldest monasteries in India, the Buddha, oldest Buddhist monasteries, uh, when they've excavated them, they've also found uh, underneath them uh, remnants of Neolithic burial sites, so Stone Age burial sites. And they would conduct sacrifices and these kinds of things. And they would be like underneath where the Buddhist temple was. And uh, so this is <coughs> religions kind of building up on top of one another physically. And it's still happening today. For example, in Perth, in the Buddhist Society of WA, the, um, the, the Dhamma Center there used to be a Christian center taken over by the Buddhists. So we're kind of uh, building up uh, on the same kind of basis. And it's interesting, the same thing happens with the festivals, that the uh, different kinds of... <coughs> um, uh, uh, festivals and occasions and so on would be uh, co-opted by the different religious traditions and they'd invest it with a new meaning or a new significance but still keeping some of the old meaning going and so it sort of gradually gradually kind of changes but in some ways stays the same and, uh, and what's interesting about all that is that uh, the same thing happens within the mind and so we can see these things are also a metaphor for how our minds work. <clears throat> because as we know from uh, you know, the, the, the research people have done on a kind of brain structure and so on, that the, kind of our brain also includes what they, you know, like the, what they sometimes call the reptilian stem and these kinds of things which sort of govern very primitive instincts and so on and also includes very sophisticated things. So these things are always going on in our brains and also in our, in our consciousness. And so we have, at the same time, very, very primitive and basic drives, you know, for food, drives for, to survive, you know, the will to live, uh, sort of the flight, fight and flight response, you know. You, you see very often in peak hour traffic, yeah, you get, <laughs> it doesn't take it very long for the Neanderthal to come out, does it, you know. This is one of the best arguments for evolution, you know, if, if, if God had created human beings, would he have created the kinds of human beings who yell at each other because someone's pulled in front of somebody else in the, in the car? 
But you can understand as we've kind of this much this tissue, we've got like this tissue of, of consciousness and culture which separates us from, from kind of cavemen. And uh, you can see, well, this is why these kinds of behaviors come out. And so sometimes we need to uh, acknowledge that as a culture and, and we sort of have football matches and things like that which allow us to sort of regress and uh, become kind of conscious of the, the kind of the lower levels of our psyche. Um, so this is all, all, all good stuff. And uh, <clears throat> if we look at the history of Christmas, um, the, uh, with many kind of antecedents to that, for example, um, in uh, Egyptian mythology, uh, they, they originally worked on a calendar, on a base 60 calendar. So the ancient Mesopotamians worked out a, uh, a numerical system based on the number 60, and so this is why we still use the number six or the base 60 system for uh, circular things like clocks. Okay, so the way we tell time is still based on the base 60 system, which is from the oldest mathematics from ancient Mesopotamia. And so is the measuring of circles and 360 degrees. So the 360 degrees of a circle was supposed to equate with the 360 degrees of the day. Okay. Sorry, sorry, 360 days of the year. All right? So you've got 360 days of the year, like the 360 degrees of the circle. Except, of course, there's a bit of a problem, which is you've got something left over. Okay? So you've got five and a bit days left over. And this was, actually, this is like a big problem, because this is showing, this is like the, the, the kind of the Achilles heel, if you like, of, of the cosmos, is that things don't quite add up. Yeah? Surely, you know, it makes sense if there was like 12 months in a year and, the, you know, the months could have added up to 360 days and it almost fits, yeah? It's almost like really kind of neat and symmetrical and you'd imagine that if it was kind of intelligently designed that surely, you know, you'd make it all fit and that would be a great demonstration of the nature of divine order. But unfortunately, it doesn't quite fit. And so there was this <coughs> gap at the end of the year and the way the Egyptians dealt with that was that they said that that was the day when the five five of the um, uh, principal gods and goddesses were born which was Osiris, Set, Horus, Isis and Nephthys who were all brothers and sisters and they were born on consecutive days and so the 25th of December was the day that Osiris was born uh, and Osiris was, was um, uh, son of a god and of a virgin, uh, and became a, a great spiritual leader and uh, king, and then later was betrayed by somebody very close to him and was murdered, uh, and then afterwards, after his murder, was uh, uh, ascended into heaven. So it might sound like a familiar story. And so, of course, many of the elements of the myth of Osiris and many other pagan deities were all adopted into the Christian mythology. And again, that's nothing uh, unusual. This is just the normal way that, that religions work. The same thing happened uh, within Buddhism, that the, the mythology of the Buddha adopted uh, ideas from ar all around it, from the culture which was around it. This is uh, inevitable. <clears throat> so the Christmas period, you know, even in that time, was, it was a time like outside of the year. So you can see it's still what we're doing today, isn't it? You know, we have our year where we have our schedule. You know, you get up in the morning, you go to work and you do all your things. And then Christmas time, everything breaks down. The normal schedule of the year is broken down. And uh, so it's a period, it's almost like a period of anarchy or a period of chaos, you know. And you can, you can actually see that. What, what would happen if Christmas went all year round? Yeah? Really, if you thought of that, what would happen if Christmas went all year round? And of course, the answer is very obvious. Society would, would be destroyed. Yeah? The world would come to an end. Nobody would work. Everyone would eat and nobody would grow any food. Everyone would go and get drunk. Governments wouldn't work. Businesses wouldn't work. Every, the whole fabric of society would completely disintegrate into chaos within a fairly short amount of time if we had Christmas all year round. It's a bit frightening, isn't it? Yeah. And so, but there's this period where you say, okay, well, we're going to we're going to like let that 
you almost kind of let the let the rules go for a period of time, and so you can do all kinds of things which you wouldn't normally do. And again, this harks back to very ancient pagan practices, uh, and is similar to things that they would call, uh, sometimes call the Saturnalia or the Bacchanalia, the two uh, festivals that were held in uh, ancient Rome and so on. And Saturn, uh, or the ancient god Saturn or Kronos, um, or Bacchus, known as Dionysus in, in Greece. And both of these were very, very old pagan deities who, whose, whose rites were associated with uh, basically getting drunk and just going for it, you know. And they were, you know, these, these kind of, they were these very, very brutal um, uh, sacrifices, kind of ripping, not just killing an animal, but like ripping the raw flesh off animals and perhaps earlier days also humans and sort of consuming uh, raw flesh and so on. This is in the Dionysian uh, rites. And so they would have this also period of license that they call the Saturnalia or the Bacchanalia. And during that period, all the rules of society would go down. So, for example, in ancient Rome... During the Saturnalia, uh, the servants were allowed to boss their masters around. So they had a period where they could they could just tell their masters what to do, and they would expect to be waited on and ordered around. All the slaves were freed, prisoners were freed from the jails, and everything like that. So the whole society was turned upside down. And uh, so you have this again this this period of chaos, which is almost like a safety valve or something for for society. It kind of works like that. And uh, so Christmas uh, was built on the basis of these kinds of festivals. And so even though today we actually think, oh, you know, people being very indulgent and getting drunk and we think this is a corruption of the spirit of Christmas, but actually historically it's not at all. Historically, that's where Christmas started out from. Yeah? And uh, that's the function that it had in, in society. And so the, the symbols that we associate with Christmas, uh, like the tree of course, being another great ancient pagan symbol, one of the most, um, the oldest symbols of the deity in, um, uh, um, in all pagan religions. And uh, the other uh, symbols associated with Christmas, like the, the mistletoe. And the mistletoe was uh, the very famous book by uh, Sir James Fraser called The Golden Bough. And in that book, he spent like a thousand pages gradually working around to this idea that the golden bough was, in fact, the mistletoe. And uh, so this was conceived uh, as, a, as a representative or a symbol of the deity. And uh, so all of these kinds of symbols, which we have in a very, they're, they're a very vestigial form, they're almost completely gone. They've almost completely lost their sacred character. They've been so completely secularized, and yet they're still there. Yeah? So it's very interesting, isn't it? This is kind of the way that culture goes and the continuity of these things, which have been actually going along for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, back as far as we can trace human culture. I think, it's, I think this is very fascinating. And uh, I was talking with Chusita the other day that I, I just found something when I was doing some research into old... Uh, civilizations in India that the, the world's oldest dentistry was actually practiced in India uh, 7000 BC. Yeah? Drilling of molars was practiced in, in, in India 7000 BC. Yeah? Amazing, huh? <laughs> it probably would have been pretty painful. I don't think they had any I mean, they maybe had some, they told you to chew some leaves or something like that to. But, you know, what that shows you is that basically people had the same issues, you know, had the same things. And you can imagine how people would feel about it. You know, they've probably got like a really bad toothache or something. They're in this agony and they've got to go to the dentist and they're probably really, you don't want to go to the dentist and it's going to hurt and stuff. It's the same kind of feelings that we have. And the same, the continuity of these festivals and these days which have somehow have a meaning and despite all of the, the, the rubbish and all of the tinsel and all of the commercialization and all of the revolting, you know, TV specials and Christmas carols everywhere you go and all of these kinds of things, still there's something about it 
which actually has some kind of meaning. And, uh, and it's kind of, it resonates with us on a very deep level. <clears throat> and one of the things, one of the ways that it does that is simply through uh, continuity. And by that continuity, when we see that continuity, we, uh, we appreciate or we understand what it means to be human. Okay? And in some sense, it lifts us out of our everyday lives. Okay? It lifts us out of the particular. Okay? Uh, and it lifts it out, us out of my hunger now. I feel hungry now. I want to have a sandwich. Yeah? And, that, and it makes you realize that actually hunger is a very universal human problem, isn't it? A universal human phenomenon. It's been driving civilizations. How do we solve the problem of hunger? How do we make sure people have food to eat? Yeah? And this has been driving technological innovations, cultural, social innovations for so many years. Why? Because those people were, when you come right down to it, pretty much the same as we are. They had pretty much the same kinds of ideas, pretty much the same kinds of needs, pretty much the same kinds of problems. Uh, and even though the forms that those things appear in is very different, so we look at the, the actual forms of those cultures are very different, but uh, we can understand it has a meaning for us why they are like that. So, for example, if we look at, again, I was just looking at the oldest Indian civilization, the Indus Valley Civilization, and, uh, you know, you can see, of course, the, the buildings that they lived in were very different from the buildings we live in, but they're not that different. They still they used bricks, right, which were more or less the same size and shape as bricks we use today, yeah? So we always think in terms of technological innovation, yeah? We've, you know, we're, we're a future-orientated society. We... You know, everything is different. We expect next year will be different, will be better and faster. But so many of the things that our culture is really based on haven't actually changed all that much. Yeah? We still use bricks. Nobody's really developed anything better than that. Yeah? And so this is... So please come in if you... Can I come in? Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, the... Uh, The, uh, the, the needs and the, um, uh, the emotions which are, uh, are shaping our culture, our families, our lives, and these have made uh, pretty much kind of the same kind of thing over those years. Yeah? And uh, so now when we look at Christmas, you know, we have a number of different connotations. Right? One connotation, we think of it as a Christian uh, ceremony, the birth of Jesus, and, and it was all kind of the, the mythology around that. <clears throat> he was like traveling on a journey and he was given birth. He had a virgin mother and he was given birth and there was the uh, massive light appeared in the sky and then the wise men came to see him and so on. And uh, not unlike the birth of just about every other uh, sage and hero and, and famous person in the ancient world. They all had the same kind of birth with different variations. The Buddha's birth story is exactly the same. His on a journey, his mother was traveling on a journey and she gave birth in a, in a humble place in a forest grove. Massive light appeared in the skies and uh, 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 great sages came to prophesy about the, the birth and so on and so forth. So these, these kind of motifs uh, are part of... Um, uh, a way of expressing um, a, a, a something, something extraordinary, something which is transcendent. Uh, transcendent okay? So when you, so for example, like the motif of a virgin birth. Okay? So these days we think Mary, Mary, had a, Mary was a virgin. And in, in the Catholic dogma it says Mary is ever virgin. She's always virgin. Well, what does it mean to say Mary is ever virgin? I mean... Jesus had brothers and sisters, we know that. <laughs> Where did they come from? And so, well, obviously it was never meant to mean literally that she was a virgin. I mean, this is just a, a, a very common myth or a symbol. But what that uh, means or the basic symbolism of it is that um, 
is that something has happened, something has like entered into the world which, has, which is going beyond those normal cycles of, of our lives, normal cycle of birth, aging and death. Yeah? We, know that we know what those cycles are like and we know how those happen. And now something new has entered into that, yeah? something which is be, in some sense beyond that cycle of birth, aging and death. Yeah? And so the, this is a way in mythology that they express that. It's one of the ways that they express that. They're announcing something extraordinary is about to happen. Something amazing has entered into the world. Pay attention because this is going to be an incredible story. Yeah? And that's, that's how the mythologists would uh, <coughs> create that. And of course, and again, in, in, in Buddhism is, is no different. And if we look at the, the life story of the Buddha, if we want to analyze that historically, we can see that it started out uh, you know, as a fairly realistic human story of, of a person who was kind of born and uh, gave, gave teachings. And we don't know that much of his, his, his life, but it was, it was definitely a very human life. And the more we go on in time, then the more you see that that gets dressed up and the more miracles get added in and the more amazing everything gets and the more you know, the devas are around and he's doing all of these psychic powers and all of these miracles accompanying him and so on. And so again, these are ways that the, the tradition tried to make vivid and to visualize the extraordinary and transcendent nature of, of, of what the, who the Buddha was and what he was doing. <clears throat> so we shouldn't... Uh, get too uh, worried about these things. And this is where you see that religions um, start to lose the plot, is when they start to, they forget about the meaning of these things and start to insist on the letter of them. And uh, so this in Christianity, of course, we're used to the idea of fundamentalism. And uh, fundamentalism, the basic idea of fundamentalism means to insist on the literal interpretation of these kind of tenets of the faith. And, and the, the initial statement of fundamentalism was made about 100 years ago, and, uh, and it was precisely things like that, that Mary had a virgin birth, for example, was one of them. This is a fundamental tenet of our faith. Even though the virgin birth was only mentioned in two out of four Gospels, it's not mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, it's not mentioned in the Gospel of John, it's not mentioned in the letters of St. Paul. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, it's generally acknowledged that there's about four or five different, in those early writings, about four or five different witnesses to what the life of Jesus was. And only two of those actually mentioned the virgin birth. So it wasn't important for the other ones. And uh, nevertheless, rather than saying, well, this is one way of expressing uh, the nature of Jesus and his divinity, which uh, has a meaning for certain people, uh, then it's a kind of insistence that it must be literally this way and it can't be any other way. So this is what we call fundamentalism. So this is something we have to be on the guard against. Yeah? Fundamentalism is a very painful and destructive force in, in religion and in spiritual life. And it's not something that we can be complacent about and not something that we should be pointing the finger and accusing other people of doing that because there's plenty of fundamentalism in, in Buddhism as well and uh, uh, plenty of people who insist on uh, taking the various myths and so on very literally and uh, who get very upset. I heard of one person in staying in a monastery in Myanmar and uh, the, the uh, one, he had an argument with one of the monks there who insisted that, the, uh, that there was like a real rabbit on the moon because in the, there's a Jataka story about how did the rabbit get on the moon because like the moon's got a shape on it that's supposed to look like a rabbit. So how did the, And there's a kind of story about the Bodhisattva in his past life and he ended up being a rabbit and so on and it got onto the moon. I don't know the story myself. And uh, so one of the monks was expressing his, his, uh, the opinion that perhaps this was like a fairy tale and wasn't meant to be taken literally because when they actually went to the moon and the astronauts walked around, they didn't see any rabbits. <laughs> and, uh, and this other fellow got very upset with them because they thought, oh, you don't have any faith, you know, you don't believe. This is, this is, this is, if it says it in the text, then it must be true. So, of course, this is missing the point, isn't it? Yeah? This is not what uh, really uh, Buddhism is about. And uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, what, 
what these uh, days like Christmas uh, point, because they're, they're, they're like they, they follow this cycle. There's something every year. It follows this cycle, and it's it uh, goes very deep into the roots of our culture. So it points to something universal about what it means to be human. Okay, and um, even though you know we can't, I don't think it's. Um, I don't think it's historically accurate to romanticize these things. I think if we look back at uh, Christmas and at the symbolism of Christmas, we, we find that actually we'll find some pretty grisly things going on. Okay? Uh, usually if you follow back religious symbolism and practices back a, a few steps, you find things like human sacrifice and so on going on. You know, Like, for example, the, uh, the Christian... Uh, giving of the bread and so on, which is a substitute for the, the body and blood of Jesus. So it's obviously like a symbolic sacrifice for human, uh, symbolic substitution for human sacrifice. And if you if you sort of peel back a few layers of religious history, you find that underneath that was an actual practice of human sacrifice that was going on sometime before that. And so we can't. I don't want to romanticize when I talk about uh, you know these pagan practices and very deep spiritual practices that are going on. It wasn't necessarily that everybody, you know, in past ages was just very happy and, you know, just saying, oh, let's have lots of metta. This is this kind of romantic idea. Yeah, well, maybe they did, but they also chopped people's heads off and these kinds of things, okay? That's also part of it. And the, 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 the victims were often willing victims, which is, seems extraordinary to us, but it's true. But... Something about that then it then evolves and then quite unconsciously, not because somebody's doing it, it evolves of its own nature and because it's like a collective contribution of so many people through all the years and so it comes down to us. We've inherited it. Okay? And we can't consciously choose to do anything about it. So nobody can say, Okay, let's do Christmas on another day, let's do Christmas on the the fourteenth of January or something like that instead. It, it doesn't work like that. And uh, you know the turkey and the, the the you know the pudding and all of these kinds of things. So we eat all these kind of really heavy, stodgy food in Australia, and we're all kind of <laughs> stinking hot outside. And we have kind of Christmas trees with snow all over it, and and uh, and so on. So you know, it's like maintain. But those things are important because that's main. You can see what you're doing is you're maintaining a continuity of culture. Yeah. And like even the turkey, you know, why, why do we eat turkeys on, on uh, Christmas Day? Yeah? Why turkey, for goodness sake? You know? All those poor turkeys that get killed on Christmas Day. Well, I would, I would think that that's probably a, a kind of a hangover from an animal sacrifice or a sacrificial motif, that there was, a, there was an animal which would be killed as part of these religious ceremonies and perhaps earlier a human as well. And so, but in their progression... And in their evolution, the, these um, um, these are like um, uh, nodes or, or, or play, coming together in our culture, places places where uh, a lot of different strings are, 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 and, 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 and ties and, and threads of our culture are, are brought together in some way. And then they express something about what we are. They express something about what we are, what it means for us to be human. And so that meaning of that message of peace on earth and goodwill to all men is actually something which is very, 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 very powerful. Even though, even though it's just a slogan, you know, we were driving down the streets of Sydney and they put this thing on peace on earth and goodwill. Well, you can be very cynical about that if you like. You can say, well, yeah, they've done that, but we're still fighting in Iraq. We're still fighting in Afghanistan, yeah? But they still express something, yeah, which is incredibly powerful, and which uh, um, which, in some way, connects with our our feeling of being part of this planet and part of one humanity. And this is something I think for our generation is is the key, and and I think we've outgrown. Uh, a state where we can uh, identify with 
like one nation or one, uh, there was nothing, no reference to Pauline Hansen there, uh, one cultural group or one religious group and these kinds of things. We've all seen that photograph of the Earth from space. Yeah? It's one of the most watched photographs, the most seen photographs of all time. The Earth from space. Yeah? We, we've seen that, the beautiful blue globe. We know nothing like it in the universe. Yeah? So we, we keep on looking for, for you know, aliens and life outside of the earth and so on. We haven't found it yet. Maybe there is, but maybe there isn't. And certainly what we do know is that it's few and far between. And we've looked a long, long way into the skies. We've searched many, many places and we can't find anything else that's remotely similar. And if you look at what's all the other planets in our solar system, None of them are very pleasant places <laughs> to want to go and live. Yeah? You could, next time you see the shots from Mars or something like that, you say, you say to yourself, do I want to go and live there? <laughs> when I rather, you know, look, you see how barren it is. Yeah? And then you see the incredible richness and diversity of what's happening here on Earth. It's the most amazing thing. We have, it's so incredibly precious for us. And earlier in the week, I... I, 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 um, I uh, usually sign some uh, online petitions for this group of us who do petitions for things like global warming and so on. And I always sign those petitions when they came around and I read their story of what happened in Bali where the, the, um, <coughs> the uh, global warming uh, debate was going on and only the, the Canadians, Japanese and Americans held out. I don't know if you all heard this kind of story, but I hadn't, I hadn't seen it in the news or anything like that. So for me, it was very powerful to see it. Only the Canadians, Japanese and Americans held out. Everyone else was arguing for very deep cuts in carbon emissions by 2020. And then eventually, because of the pressure, the, the, the Canadians crumbled and the Japanese crumbled and it was only the Americans, only the US against the whole rest of the world. And they said, no, no, we're, we're not going to sign. And all the delegates just booed them and abused them. So all the diplomats from around the world just abused the Americans. And uh, they were so... Uh, embarrassed by that, that he just got up and said, we will join the consensus. And uh, when I read this in this description, it was just so powerful for me to, just to see that, that admission. Actually, everybody agrees on that. Yeah? This is something that actually everybody has that value that this, wor this earth is worth saving. Yeah? And that we, as humanity and as people, have that duty to do that, much as we like wombats and koala bears and so on, they're not going to save the planet, okay? <laughs> the wombats are not going to get together and sign a global petition <laughs> against global warming, okay? It's up to us. There's only one species that can do that. Yeah? And we've, done, we've caused the problem in the first place. It's our responsibility. But we can fix it. And there's nothing... Uh, it's nothing superhuman or, or, or anything about it. It's just being a bit sensible in the way, a bit ra rational and reasonable in the way that we use our resources. Uh, you can see that in, on a national level that we've already done that in many respects. That, that for example, if you look at the history of industrialization, the, the early industrialized countries like England, you know, they made all of these factories and so on and completely polluted their, 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 their environments in many ways. Uh, later on, they realized the damage they were doing and then cleaned up the act. And so the, like, the Thames now has fish in it and is relatively clean and so on and so forth. So it is possible. And, uh, but there just needs to be that will. And that will is based on that recognition that actually this is our planet. And it's the only one. And this is our humanity. This is our people. And we're all going to suffer because we cannot separate ourselves. We cannot say, you are over there, I'm over here, I'm all right, Jack, you know, <laughs> bugger you, you can do what you like, I don't care. Those days are gone. We just cannot be like that anymore. We've seen that picture, we've seen the earth from space and we know that the only ethic that is relevant for us is the ethic that was taught by the Buddha two and a half thousand years ago. May all beings be happy. 
And that is the only basis for a good moral life and for the survival of our planet which we have left. So this is my talk for you this evening on Christmas. So I hope you all have a merry one.